Good morning, wrestling fans. Welcome to PWR Today for a very special edition of PWR Today. It is Memorial Day. It is May 31st, 2021. The man they call me did. The man they refer to as Matthew Thomas. Good morning, Matthew. How you doing? You are the best man, Meathead, right? Isn't that your gimmick? The best man. The no, best no, man no. I'm not the man they refer to as Miro. To be re- uh, Miro on Twitter. To be Miro. Oh, I, and, and you're not, and I take it you're not wearing your Miro hoodie. I'm not. But you know what I'm getting really good at is that Twitter machine that people talk about now. Because, sure. uh, you know, with the PWR Today and the PWR Draft, uh, Twitter handle. I'm having to put the Twitter names in there over and over and over again. So I'm getting actually pretty good at it. Yeah, yeah. And there was a lot of action last night in the uh, PWR draft land. Although a lot of spots changed, your spot stayed just the same, Meathead. Yes, right in the middle, right dead in the middle. What was it that you called it? The uh, you're basically in the Goldilocks position. And not too hard, not too soft, just right. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's hey, you exactly know what that fits just right and feels just right is uh, merchandise from our friends at Collar and Elbow. Matthew Thomas, go ahead and tell us about the Memorial Day sale over at Collar and Elbow. Oh, my goodness. I think they're pa- practically paying you to wear Collar and Elbow. Uh, CollarandElbowBrand.com. So it is, correct me if I'm wrong, there is a 25% off, and and this was, uh, this was thrown into our radar the other day. If you enter special promo code SNOWMAN, you get an extra 10% off, I believe. And then there is also, oh, in the, uh, for the people that are confused out there, SNOWMAN uh, is S as in sandwich, A as in Anderson, N as in Nigeria, uh, what was I spelling? Sandman. No, did I spell oh, Sandman or Snowman? Oh, smokes, man. We've Wait. got a big pay-per-view to talk about, and you're goofing off spelling Dude, no, no, Snowman. No, I think now. I spelled Sandman. I think I spelled Sandman instead of uh, Nigeria Octopus. Here, uh, here's what I want octopus. you to know. Start w with this promo Wanda. code, Matthew. Start with this promo code, Memorial25. That'll get oh. you 25% off from Collar and Elbow Brand. I was, I mean, seriously, when I saw that, I started skimming through the stuff again to see what yeah. they got because uh, I got to get me something to wear again, you know, for the summer, maybe something for the 4th of July. But Memorial 25, uh, Snowman, uh, Al, Uncle Al put that out there as well. And, you know, all the other promo codes, including Linda K. I think it expires by the end of tonight. Hmm. So it says May 26th through May 31st, 25% off Memorial Day sale at CollarandElbowBrand.com. You know what? We need to reach out to Uncle Al and give him my idea. I think the next promo code he runs, I think it should be Super Catcher Fragilistic Expialidocious. And you're just going to do 20 minute shows on spelling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that was a uh, snowman was kind of tricky. You know, I've got my flow, I've got my routine. You know, it's second nature now. I can do the Linda K promo. Uh, you know, with my eyes closed, and the snowman thing is going to take me a little while to get used to. So just bear with me, audience. We'll uh, we'll get through that. We have one very quick bit of news before we break down double or nothing from last night. And the reason I am bringing this up, it is AEW related. Uh, AEW is reportedly going to be releasing Spanish broadcast team member Willie Urbina. Uh, Apparently, during the international feed on Fight TV of Friday night's AEW Dynamite, Urbina was impersonating Hikaru Ishida's accent during a commercial break. Uh, This is 2021, and that's not something that was ever right. But, I mean, you know, we're talking that that stuff is global now, and you can't do that. I mean, back in the day, we joked about this off air. But, uh, you know, Jesse the Body Ventura, Bobby the Brain, Heen, and those guys, you know, they were heel commentators. They used to say some very colorful things that just wouldn't fly today. Yeah. Willie Urbina did it this last weekend. Yeah. Now, you can't do that. And AEW made the right choice. And it still surprises me. It's not that, official yet. Yeah. But it, it's, it surprises me that anybody would do something like that and, and think that would not be the, uh, the outcome. All right, so let us talk about Double or Nothing last night, Matthew. We will say this for weeks and weeks to come. This has got to be the pin that you put in the board of the coming out party from COVID as far as a live event. Because AEW, they went full house. They had a sellout. 
And it looked it, it felt it, and I'm telling you, welcome home. I mean, welcome back. Uh, Matthew, before we go into the matches, tell me, how did you feel looking at that? By the way, uh, you know, 7.30 Eastern looked pretty sunny to me. Yeah. Yeah, no, without a doubt. And honestly, I mean, yeah, it's a pay-per-view. You're going to have it in the nighttime. But dailies, I think, looks at its best with some daylight. That is a beautiful venue right there. Not that it's not beautiful at nighttime, but, you know, my goodness, man, Florida in late May, uh, in the daylight, you really see what a cool setup they've got there. So I like the fact that... With a full uh, house, you see what a cool setup yeah, they have exactly. there, too. Because when they shot backwards and looked up, the third deck was yeah. full. Exactly. But no, is in regards to your pen, I think you're exactly right. I mean, Mania was great it was a huge step forward it was monumental and mania was a couple of months ago so they worked with you know what they had and what they felt comfortable with doing at that time frame that being said mania did not feel fully normal you had cardboard cutouts this smaller venue but my goodness this felt normal there was nothing about this that said abnormality, that said we're doing something different. No, you're exactly right. It translated visually, and it translated uh, the audio. I mean, it it sounded great. I had it on at home. I had the surround on, and my goodness, just I, I had it cranked up higher than I've had a wrestling program maybe ever because it felt so good to feel that real reaction again. Let's talk pre-show match. NWA Women's World Championship was on the line. Serena Deeb took on Rio, and they looked amazing. Mm-hmm. This could have been wrestled in the beginning of the COVID era. This was an amazing match. The winner and still NWA Women's World Champion, Serena Deeb. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think they've got a really good thing with their NWA relationship. And Serena Deeb, I think, is a... You know, she's also somebody you put that pin in as a champion you stand behind. And uh, they've got a really good thing there. And I hope, you know, she's the NWA champion. You don't hear a lot of talk of the actual NWA promotion. And I hope at some point, you know, there's that cross promotion there because I think they need to get some eyes on that product as well. All right. We both predicted this, and I think we both uh, really – thought it was going to be for the same reasons and it came to fruition adam page brian cage opening up the pay-per-view proper and you bring brian cage out because he's the heel first yeah. looking like the terminator that looked cool the machine brian cage the ftw champion but then bring up the face hangman adam page and boy oh boy did that dude ooze excitement we've been saying it that guy is your aew champion before the years at you know, you're just counting what down. What team is he on, by the way? Whose fantasy draft team is he on? Uh, he's in the Dark Order. That, uh, that's no, 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 on. no. He's on the team they call Meatheads. Yeah, yeah. No, that was a good choice. Uh, I think you made a very wise calculation there. And uh, you got him. I mean, you got him several rounds in. So, you know, he had been overlooked by a couple of people. Um, you know, that was probably... You probably drafted him after I drafted both WWE champions and both WWE... Uh, well, I've got one WWE Tag Team Champion and probably the NXT Champion after I drafted them. And then, uh, yeah, then after I drafted the, the uh, Money in the Bank winner, Matthew Smith, Matthew <laughs> to watch 2021. But that was a good pickup on your part. Okay, let's talk about the match here. Um, you know what? I liked Brian Cage going for the Buckshot Lariat. But yeah. really, the match ended up the way we both thought it would be. The winner of the match, uh, Hangman Adam Page. Again, let's just say it right here, right now. This dude will become the champion, I believe, in November. Uh, Without a doubt, I think he's definitely... I don't know if it's November, maybe December, but uh, definitely full gear is November. So when's all Yeah, you know, and honestly, I mean, it would not surprise me if it was Labor Day weekend. I mean, I think it could possibly become that early. But before the year is, before the year's up. And seeing Brian Cage going away from Taz, I think... Brian Cage as a as a face is a good thing. There's some very big viable matchups uh, that can happen there. And, I mean, Brian Cage is a star. Next match is the match for the Tag Team Championships. The Young Bucks taking on the team of Moxley and Kingston. Holy smokes. If Hangman and Page didn't open the show, these guys should have opened yeah. up. Because the wild thing and the crowd and coming out with the crowd. Is this them 
is it the music or is it the fact that we're in front of a full house? It's all of the above. I mean, Moxley and Kingston, this is the best. This is my favorite Moxley that I've ever seen, even going back, you know, WWE to the Dean Ambrose days. I never quite, quite got Moxley or Ambrose the way that I do right now. It just, it feels right having him with Kingston. And I want to go back to the last match real quick. Probably the most vocal I was last night was shouting at my TV. There was a very special moment that I wanted to see kind of my, all right, things are fully back to normal. It, it was as Paige was exiting, as Paige was exiting, a fan might have been an AEW talent. I don't know. I think it was a fan offered him their drink. And he looked at it really close, man. He, I thought he was going to take it. I thought we were going back to Paige, taking drinks from the crowd again. I wanted to see it. He gave him a cheers, probably the responsible thing. But not to be outdone, in the second match, if you notice, somebody did take a drink from the crowd, did drink a stranger's drink, and his name was John Moxley. <laughs> so uh, you were tracking drinks from the crowd, and uh, the winner is John Moxley, match two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm dead serious, man. That that was uh, one of the highlights of the night for me. Okay. Uh, special commentators rotating in through these matches. First match, we had Taz calling the action along with JR, Tony, and uh, Excalibur. Match two, Don Callis coming to call the match with the other three. <laughs> Is it too much to have four people call in a match? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's, it's just, there's, you... It's hard. It's hard to coordinate, man. It it really is. I mean, in a lot of cases, three people is tough, and it's become so normal now. But you know, there's a lot of potential of tripping over people, and there's also a lot of hanging back too to try to avoid tripping over people. Yeah. Um, if I had one bone to pick with this match, if we're supposed to suspend disbelief. And I've said this multiple times, and it's even been stories on the internet in the last year or so. Seriously, the 10-second count of the double teams, dude, the Bucks were in the ring for a minute at a time. You know? <laughs> yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's it's tough, man. I mean, if you know, if it was my federation, we'd always uh, obey the 10 counts. We'd always enforce it. And, you know, what I would do early on is I would, I'd have tag team championship tag team matches thrown out because they disobeyed the 10 count. You got to put those rules down pretty firm. And, uh, you know, I think in my promotion and my first very big tag team match on pay-per-view, you'd have that thing tossed out because somebody uh, disobeyed that 10 count and or maybe because they didn't use the tag ropes. But other than that, I thought it was a great match. Uh, plenty of false finishes. And really, you know, without making fun of uh, one of the Young Bucks hairdos, what was going on there? <laughs> I think that was Nick. Or is it Matt? I think it was I, Nick. I like it. You know, it makes it easier for me to tell the Bucks apart now that you got different hair colors. Uh, I'm okay with the match. It was a fun match. But again... When they were doing the, you know, uh, elite trigger or they were doing the super kick party, honestly, we're at three, four minutes that they're in the ring together. Yeah. No warnings, no nothing. Yeah. Come on. I mean, the, yeah. let's stick to something. Winners yeah. and still champions, the Young Bucks. 100%. And, you know, this is one of the matches where it dawned on me. But if you look at the card throughout the bulk of the night, it, man, I don't know of a promotion that has really done as good of a job in the last. 20 years or so really since the advent of the attitude era where you've got your core audience very very deliberately and very vocally cheering the baby faces and booing the heels mm. that was you, pretty clear you don't You're right. you know especially amongst a quote-unquote smart wrestling crowd which you know you would certainly think you've got the people that are traveling to daily's place my goodness and i mean even even somebody like the Bucks, who you think are this super over tag team in this type of crowd. No, man, no, this crowd a- wanted Moxley and AEW Kingston. has done such a good job with their faces and their heels. You've got your very, uh, you know, very into it pro wrestling audience cheering and booing who they're quote unquote supposed to. 
Let's talk Casino Battle Royal, the winner earning a future AEW World Championship match. Now, we'll get to uh, the results of the PWR draft for all double or nothing. But, uh, Matthew, you and myself, we made some pickups, some free agent pickups that we had kind of waiting in the balance. Mm -hmm. I picked up somebody that was going to be in this match. I picked up Christian Cage. You picked up Pac, the bastard. So you were going to get into that title match right away. But uh, there was a surprise uh, wild card, the Ace of Spades, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I won't rush to tell you who it is yet, but uh, Leo, let me uh, talk about the rest of the match first, if you will. <laughs> I'll be happy to. Uh, 10 versus Bowens, uh, Aaron Solo, Brian Pillman Jr., Christian Cage, Cole Cabana, boom, boom. Dustin Rhodes, Evil, Uno, Griff Garrison, Isaiah K- uh, Cassidy, Jungle Boy, Lee Johnson, Mark Wen, Matt Hardy, Matt Seidel, Max Caster, Yow, Yow, uh, Nick Camarado, Penta El Zero Miedo, uh, Powerhouse Hobbs, and Sir Pentico. And then the mystery. Uh, do you like the pairings of the suits? So no. you get, you know, five at a time, five at a time, five at a time, five at a time. I pull out the creativity, but my goodness, I it's one of those things, you know how you do something that, you do, and you figure out how to do it, and then it seems fairly straightforward, and then you don't have to do it regularly, and then you forget how to do it. That's kind of the thing with this Casino Battle Royal. Every time I forget how the thing works, and by the time that I remember kind of what they're going for, it's taken me out of it. Nah, it's not my cup of tea, man. I, I appreciate it being something different, but uh, it's it's a little bit too gimmicky for me. The... Surprise entrant, former WWE manager of Bobby Lashley, former WWE Cruiserweight champion Leo Rush is in the house. He looked like the AEW version of uh, the sommelier. Oh, Reginald. Reggie, yeah. Uh, A lot of rolling, a lot of ducking, a lot of diving. I kind of liked it. He was moving, man. He was moving. And, you know, he's somebody that, uh, you know, I've always enjoyed seeing on TV. His in-ring abilities and also... When he was Bobby Lashley's hype man, you know, that's really kind of what, uh, you know, everybody forgets about that. Cause now MVP is, you know, killing it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Showing you most muscular Bobby. Yeah. He was, uh, I need to go back and listen to some Leo rush, uh, Bobby Lashley hype man clips. That was fun. And that was really what got us this incarnation of Bobby Lashley. Now we did have the segue with the whole, uh, Lana angle there for a while, but mm-hmm. it was really Leo rush that kind of relaunched, uh, the Bobby Lashley run in WWE. So glad to see him there. And before we get into the finish, I do want to add one thing. I, I picked up on it on Dynamite the last couple of weeks. And again, we heard it tonight. You got to let Brian Pillman Jr. be Brian Pillman Jr. I get it. We enjoy the great job Dark Side of the Ring did. Getting to see Brian Pillman Jr. Uh, more so than we really have, you know, and kind of get his story I think it yeah. made a lot of people Brian Pillman Jr. Uh, supporters. But my goodness, AEW, you got to build your star. You got to put him over and stop referencing that documentary. Yeah. We'll talk about it this week. Uh, the Ultimate Warrior documentaries from a and and from Dark Side of the Ring both aired within a week of each other. Mm-hmm. And the uh, uh, big contrast. So yeah. we'll yeah. talk about it down the road uh, this week. Finally, uh, the end of the match. And I thought, for the team they call Meatheads, I just walked in the door and grabbed the winner of the match. But it came down to Matt Hardy, Christian Cage, and Jungle Boy. Well, Matt Hardy thought he was going to get Christian a double team. You know, I I think that little hand gesture stuff he was doing is, hey, remember that time that we had that TLC match? Maybe you and I could be friends and let's get him out. Is that what we were supposed to think? Yeah, that's exactly, you know, and prior to, you know, once we got the final 10 or so, I'm thinking to myself, man, it'd be kind of cool if it came down to Christian and uh, Matt Hardy just because of the callback. But they did the right thing there. You had that. But at the end of the day, you know, what new talent are you putting over? So I give them credit for giving us that, making it part of the story. And here's the thing with Christian. Here's the thing with your pickup. Had there not been an audience there, I think you might have gone the Christian ride. But you got to remember now, we're back to having an audience. And I think there's going to be booking decisions potentially that factor into a crowd reaction 
that wouldn't have been factored into the business of a non-audience. And yep. I think Jungle Boy going over last night might have been it was one of for the crowd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because again, he has a sing-along song. Yes, and they that crowd was not split. I thought Christian Jungle Boy, it was going to be a little more split, was not split at all. And it's pro you're right. I mean, the song probably really factors into it, but my goodness, that crowd really wanted Jungle Boy. Anthony Ogogo with QT Marshall taking on Cody Rhodes, the American dream for one night with R.D. Anderson on his side. Uh, I didn't see this match going any other way other than Cody Rhodes winning. Thoughts? Yeah, I thought there might be a chance because I did not see this accomplishing much, you know, and his opponent pretty new on the scene. So I thought it'd be two a and oh, get, yeah, a, a good way to get him over. Um, I, out of all the matches on the card tonight, not that I didn't enjoy, not both guys didn't do a great job, but this seemed to move the needle less on anything that was on that card last night. It just, I don't know, I don't know what we necessarily got out of it other than seeing Cody come out as the American dream and really kind of trying to, you know, go that American hero route uh, over over this holiday weekend. I like uh, a couple things out of Anthony Gogo. Doom, 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 doom. That's his theme song, is the, that bell. Yeah. So I love that. And uh, his nickname is The Governor. So. Oh, he's a, he's a governor of a, of, a, of a state, I assume? No, just Governor. Was that one of those special elections they had? Did Anthony Agogo win? One of yes. those recalls or whatever? That's okay. exactly and, what he did. And just, to, just to kind of circle back around to, I mean, I think... You know, we talked about it ever since Cody lost that stipulation of not being able to fight for the title. You know, I know I know in a lot of cases, Cody's not trying to come in there and go Jeff Jarrett and TNA route. He's not trying to be the promoter that is at the top of the card. But I feel like they're kind of in a weird spot with Cody. And I feel like it's almost to a point that Cody is trying too hard not to put himself in. Right. In, near anywhere near the top of the car to where it feels like in a lot of cases he's being underutilized. I would say so. AEW TNT Championship, a man that is now being utilized and looking really good. The recreation of Miro taking on the challenger, Lance Archer. Your thoughts on how the match flowed? And again, the result, uh, winner and still champion, Miro. It was a great match. For Lance Archer's sake, I wish Miro's first title defense would have been against somebody else. Um, I think Archer and Miro are of a very similar mold. I mean, they're these big, you know, big bruising guys. And to me, you knew Miro was going to have to go over, have to go over strong. I wish he and Archer could have ran around in different circles for a little while and maybe yeah. built up to this match because Archer is a talent and he is, like I said, it's a similar style to Miro. And I think you could have pulled off this pay-per-view tonight where both guys would have picked up decisive wins and built up to this match. The match felt rushed. It was a good match. Um, it felt know, Leo rushed? Yeah, maybe that's Miro's next opponent is, uh, is Leo Rush. I mean, they made sure to the commentary team made sure to reference the fact that he did not submit, you know, that he passed out. Um, but I, I want to see, I want to see uh, Archer built up. Okay. The women's championship was on the line with Hikaru Shida taking on the, the face of the division. Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, I like the package that they put together for her beforehand. She goes, I wake up at 5 a.m., I go to work, I still have my practice, then I work out, and then I watch wrestling, and this is all I do. I mean, literally, she is the face, and she is now the new AEW Women's Champion. Um, I got to go back. For some reason, I thought of this. You know how Britt Baker puts on the glove, and she's going to stick her hands in the mouth mm -hmm. of her opponent, uh, opponents. When Moxley got bladed, um, in the second match, dude, how come they didn't ask the ref to change his gloves? You saw half his hand hanging out, right? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I didn't think about that. Did not. I really enjoyed this match, and I thought that, you know, there was something, it was weird, because normally you don't have a spot where your person that's out there to help you hits you, and then the match continues on for another 10 minutes. Yeah. With nothing. Uh, Rebel, not Reba, and it says it up and down on her back. 
uh, Rebel hits Britt Baker with the crutch, but nothing comes of it. Yeah. That was a little weird. Yeah, it was just trying to, uh, you know, trying to get you in that traditional false finish. Uh, something big's going to happen here mindset. And then you've got another 10 minutes of action. I will say this. I, I think that at least if my ears heard it correctly, she probably had the second biggest reaction of the night to Adam Page. I mean, Britt yeah. Baker's over in that crap. Super over. Uh-huh. All right. Uh Speaking about somebody who has always been over as well, Darby Allen and Sting teaming up against Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page. They started off with a cinematic entrance again, and this time it does not look like they were pulled over by the police. <laughs> <laughs> because at the last pay-per-view, when they did the cinematic match, and they were driving around the streets of Jacksonville at 3 in the morning, they got pulled over three times because they saw Darby well, skateboarding. Well, when you're driving a classic uh, you know, Chevy convertible, Versus, you know, your your Datsun with your tape deck in there. You know, I think I think they give you a little more, a little more. Uh, or maybe they just called the boys in blue and said, "Hey, by the way, we're filming again. Leave us alone." <laughs> oh my goodness! In a lot of ways, and you know, when you break it down versus the actual technical in ring work, I know there are other matches that you're going to put up above it. But in a lot of ways, for me, this was match of the night. And I think it was a bit of it was nostalgia seeing Sting so look so good, and I mean having this match open with Sting doing a high spot off the poker chips. Come on, man! And it started with that. He took his shirt off and just did it. Yeah, that was that was before the bell, you know. Yeah. Before um, we and again had had a bell. The team, the team of Darby Allen and Sting works too because. Again, they seem to work with each other. You know, Darby yeah. Allen had half of his face paint was stink paint. Yeah, no, absolutely. And a lot of times when you try to put, you know, a, a, an established talent with a younger talent, it feels forced. This does not feel forced. It feels like it works. I say that and I go back to like Flair and Miz, you know, pairings like yeah. that where you're doing it specifically for the rub but these, they do feel like, you know, basically of the same mold. And I want to say this about the match. Early on in the show, I noticed some of the AEW talent sitting ringside. You know, and I'm thinking to myself, man, you got a packed house. Why are you giving those seats to talent? Well, we found out in this match why the talent had some front mm-hmm. ring seats. And it was a freaking amazing spot with Ethan Page launching Darby Allen. They said that it was his brother, too. Mm-hmm. Darby Allen's brother was sitting there. Yeah, I, that you know, that's one of those things that you don't see the spot coming. You know, it's, of course, not a high-risk spot like that and not as memorable. But it, the setup of it kind of a little bit reminds me of Undertaker and Foley when he came off the cell. And the fact that it's not one of those where you've got the table by the apron for 15 minutes and you're expecting the spot. He picks him up and throws him. Yeah. Let's talk about the AEW World Championship, a three-way match. Kenny Omega, Orange Cassidy, and Pac. The, Were you the sub- way I judge these type of matches is, did I feel, even though I kind of mentally knew how we were yeah. going to have the match end, did I feel I could be wrong at any given point? I felt I could have been wrong about 20 yeah. times. Yeah, 100% there. And, you know, you're basically, they did a really good job of not just the false finishes, but the psychology as far as where everybody was at. You know, you're saying, okay, this guy just took something, but this guy's hanging around outside. Happened with Cassidy, happened with Pac. And my goodness, that false finish where if Cassidy was going to win, it wasn't going to be in a decisive way. And when I believe, you know, Pac had hit a maneuver or maybe it was Omega, but Cassidy came in, threw the other person off. Pac hit covering. the maneuver. Omega's laying down. Cassidy ran in, pushed Pac out the yeah. ropes, and went for the pinfall. That crowd popped. That crowd thought that might be the case. No, you're exactly right. Um, and they did a great job, no matter what it looked like on paper, the way that this match was orchestrated with the false finishes and just with guys in different spots, down to... The ref bump down to Audrey coming in and even down to the final pinfall where you've got Omega, you know, rolling up, rolling up Cassidy uh, with that reversal. My goodness, they did. This match was was orchestrated very, very good. I enjoyed the fact we haven't talked about it yet, but Kenny wore all his belts. Yeah, that was huge. It was huge. He had four belts on. Well, you know who he reminded me of? He reminded me a little bit of the general manager and CEO of Team 
not of team uh, Nelson Mandela. Be, except <laughs> Nelson Mandela had would have two more belts. Ha ha. Ha ha. Yeah. No. Uh, there was a spot that he also used the belts, and in order, he hits uh, he hits uh, Pac with the AAA belt, then the TNA belt, and finally the AEW belt. So I, the fact that they all got used, it's fantastic. So. Uh, quick announcement that happened in between this and the main event. The world's strongest man is all elite. My goodness, that was a big get. That was a uh, that was a big get. I mean, you got a WWE Hall of Famer. My goodness. And again, we talked about this uh, a few weeks ago on this very program. Mark Henry's been pushing, trying to get another match. Yeah. Yeah. And he looked good, man. He looked good. And. My goodness, you know, if there's a place that's going to do it, you know, Sting got a match last night, what, six years after the his last whole, TV match the in whole WWE? Seth, yeah. yeah, Seth Rollins match, you know. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, the cool thing about the Sting match was you never got the impression watching this of this as something that shouldn't happen. You right. know, there, and, and that was not always the case with. You know, matches from from former retired talent that we've seen in, in the past. And and it did not feel exploitive either. And that's the big thing, you know, versus what a lot of other promotions have done in the past. Like you felt genuinely excited and you felt happy for Sting and you really, really felt uh, felt good watching him go. The main event, stadium stampede match, inner circle, the pinnacle, um, MJF's glittery football half shorts come on man <laughs> you're already the smallest looking guy there matter of fact you look a little smaller than sammy guevara sammy looks a little bigger than you know but uh the, wearing those pants didn't help i loved everything about this match again it's entertaining to me um i find it ironic that uh they went into the building this time because you got to do different obviously yeah. than you did the last time we saw the new jaguars coach urban meyer uh show up as, you know, they were throwing footballs at the MJF for a while. Um, I love the chairman sitting in a room full of chairs. I loved uh, Conan as the DJ, you know, in a club fight. The back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Matthew Thomas, this ends with Sammy Guevara kicking Spears' face into a chair, wedged in the corner, and he went to the top. He had a 630 senton on Spears, which was perfectly timed out. And it gets the pinfall at the end of the night. The crowd oh. sings Judas. Yeah. Um, a little surprised initially when I saw that the AEW match was going on second to last, you know, and you could have read this several different ways. You could have read it. Omega was going to win and you did not want to close your first show back with a heel winning, or you could have won it, read it. They were going to do something unexpected. The, the audience might not, you know, really have known how to make what to make of it, like, you know, put it on uh, pack. So it did not necessarily fully tip the hat when you saw this was going on last. Um, I do think you ran a little bit of a risk with having the cinematic match right here, though, and them spending as much time as they did backstage. Um, I would have liked to have seen more of this up front. And the audience, I, I think you ran the risk of getting the crowd out of it. I mean, they have sat there. They've been hot all night. And, you know, it's not like the middle of a show let up spot where you give people a chance to catch their breath. The popcorn this, match is what you call them. Yeah, this is the main event. And you're spending the bulk of it outside people having to watch on the screen. So I do think it was a bit of a calculated gamble. The calculated gamble was your outcome was going to be everybody back in the arena singing uh judas and thankfully yeah. when they got back in the arena everybody was back into it you know and, and you could make the case that you're going to let them cool down so they get hotter than they have been the entire night and i think that's what ended up happening here but i feel like it was a risk nonetheless um my only issue with it is i feel like it was a bit unnecessary to have a cinematic match in your first pay-per-view back your cinematic matches were done basically to get you through that COVID well, era. This one wasn't cinematic necessarily. This was just a falls count anywhere match. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was. And I, I say cinematic in this sense that there were cutscenes. And to me mm -hmm. that 
kind of notates more of a cinematic match than it does just a backstage falls count anywhere. But that being said, there was so many good things in the show and they got the desired outcome, which was that feel good moment. And outside of just the Judas thing, you got your first show back. Dude, we didn't talk about how did inner circle enter the stadium? Yeah. Yeah. You had the call back to Sammy and the whole golf cart thing. No, 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 no. They repelled oh, down oh, the damn right. scoreboard. That's right. That's right. Yeah. They did. They did. That was that was pretty that was pretty cool looking. Yeah. So and again, Urban Meyer, Charlie Strong from the Jaguars, you know, helping out with, you know, chucking footballs at Jericho so he could throw them at MJF. I Yeah. I was but okay with we, it. And and we did let's let's not forget the fact though, we did have Sammy Guevara picking up the pinfall victory over Sean Spears. So this pay-per-view concluded, you know, inner circle versus pinnacle who they showcased at the end, more or less solo in the arena because MJF and Jericho were doing their thing up top was Guevara and Sean Spears. So let's, you know, let's not bury that because that, that those were the two talents they put on display. And I think this was a big, big moment for both of those, especially Sammy Guevara picking up that win. Absolutely. An amazing pay-per-view. Um, well worth the um, attention. I don't know if I would have done four hours, but it was worth watching. Uh, lots of great stuff happened. Let's talk PWR draft before we go send it home. Matthew Thomas, I don't know if you want to talk PWR draft because it was not a good night to you. Yeah. But here's what happened. A new one-night, single-night record was now set by Linda K, 560 points scored last night at AEW's Double or Nothing. Matthew Thomas, you only scored 130. I stayed steady, scored 390 points. The new totals brought to you by, yes, we still use the accounting firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howell. In first place, in her first time ever, Linda K leads at 625 points. In second place, up close and creepy like Uncle Joe Biden sniffing your neck <laughs> at 620 points, the man they call Meathead, and like a distant memory, like a fart in a wind, all the way in dead last. Matthew Thomas at 375 points. You know, it's it's strategy because I knew this was going to happen. You know, basically going into this pay-per-view, this is exactly how I wanted it to happen. So uh, we're right on course, man. We're right on track. Oh, yeah, you know. You, uh, you know, Linda, I'm happy for her, you know, get her some time up front. Um, you know, your position hasn't changed. You kind of like that middle spot there. (laughs) And, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, you're, you can kind of hang where you're comfortable at. And then, uh, yeah, we're going to see, uh, we're going to see what, uh, Matthew's stable of champions do here in the next several months. Fade like a fart in the wind. That's what they're going to yeah, do. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. You know, if memory serves me correctly, Matthew's got about every champion in WWE, and we get those extra special points for specialty matches. And my goodness, what's the next pay-per-view? Hell in a Cell? And there's well, the next the pay-per-view bank. is NXT's In Your House now. Karrion Cross yeah. is on Team Matthew Mandela or whatever it's called. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> the name of the team. The name of the team is... Nelson Mandela. Nelson Matt Della, that's right. There it is. That is only one of two NXT talent that are on the three teams. Uh, Linda K does have Finn Balor, but we see him moving up to the big roster soon. You and I both uh, claimed our free agent picks, so now we have 10 members each. Linda only has nine, but she can pick up anybody at any time. I'm telling you what, um, you guys better start scoring some points soon. Because once team that they call Meatheads kicks into gear, yeah. again, I've got one champion now. I know you said you have all the champions. I have one champion now. Um, it's just a matter of time before I get AEW champions, before I get WWE champions. It won't be fair to you. Well, you know, and here's the thing, too. Um, you know, uh, I completely forgot what I was going to say. We were talking about champions, and I was talking about Finn Balor and Karrion Cross. And belts, and I was, I was potentially going to make a reference about belts holding up my pants and cutting off my circulation. Um, yeah, I completely forgot my uh, my thought. It was a really good one, and I just I completely forgot it. I think your thought was, "I'm sorry, Meathead. I know you're going to win." Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that is PWR today for a special Memorial Day edition. 
Uh, Matthew oh. Thomas, we will talk tomorrow. Uh, hey, we're going to talk. I remember. Tomorrow. I remember what I was going to say. Um, you know, it probably, as far as the draft goes, the two people. You know, I'm I'm considering making moves with. I mean, we had both Orange Cassidy and Pac. Um, you know, so you don't know how, you know, when they're going to be back at the top of the title picture. Um, I missed part of the match. I did. I personally did not see a butt crack. But keep in mind, we've got the butt crack rule. If a butt crack is exposed by one of your team members, you can drop that person. No penalty. And uh, I had to step away for a little while to go do some stuff while the match was on. So if any of our listeners did, in fact, spot a butt crack of Orange Cassidy or Pac, feel free to freeze frame that. And uh, send me that uh, that screenshot. Well, I'm glad people are sending screenshots to <laughs> at the real M Thomas on Twitter uh, of butt cracks. So for Matthew Hashtag Thomas, tag butt crack alert. Yep, for Matthew Thomas on the manly call meeted. Hey, thanks for stopping by. We'll talk to you tomorrow morning. So long, everyone.